Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, and uh, welcome to the second of, th of three series uh, for the COVID-19 uh, Ramadan series. Uh, this series is not focusing on just the, on the, the physical aspect of the illness uh, due to this uh, pandemic, but also it's, it's actually geared towards the psychological aspect Last uh, week, we had a, a great talk about uh, resilience and building resilience. And this week, we're looking uh, to have another uh, great talk by one of our community members, Dr. Ahmed Zubairi, uh, about anxiety and uh, stress uh, in, in children. Uh, Dr. Zubairi uh, finished uh, his medical school and then had his uh, adult psychiatry training at uh, uh, Long Island, New York. And then he had his pediatric uh, specific training at uh, the University of Connecticut. Um, then he practiced for a few years in Missouri uh, before moving to Michigan in 2006. And he has been here uh, since. He, has, uh, he is involved in teaching medical students and psychiatry residents in both uh, Michigan State and Wayne State Universities. Uh, as he ho hold uh, a faculty uh, position there. Uh, he has many interests and uh, two of the interests, uh, two of his interests are anxiety and uh, uh, stress uh, among depression uh, in, in patients. Uh, so Jazakumullah Khairan for uh, taking the time to prepare this talk for everybody. Inshallah, this talk would be recorded so we could share it uh, similar to last week uh, with the community. If you have questions, uh, go ahead and uh, send them in the chat box and then inshallah, we'll try to answer them at the end. Uh, go ahead, Brother Ahmed. Dr. Ahmed, as alaikum wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, uh, um, Brother Wasim, um, for uh, NMCA for organizing this. This is uh, a very, very important uh, topic. Uh, in this current time, especially because uh, if we uh, if we look at the current situation, we have like what 1.3 million um, people affected by COVID-19, but a lot more than pe more people than that have been affected by stress, anxiety. Second of all, the changes that uh, the COVID-19 situation brings uh, uh, with all the um, self-isolation, quarantine, lockdown, and everything. And uh, obviously, children are generally a little bit more um, uh, vulnerable to uh, stress and anxiety with these kind of stressors because of their lim relatively limited capability to understanding, um, you know, the, the situation that they're in. So, um, so I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna uh, go over some of the learning objectives first. So we're gonna look at a couple of different things. Uh, I wanna start uh, not just jumping in directly and talking about uh, COVID-19 and, and stressors right away. I think it's important for us to just go through a little uh, developmental um, trajectory process here to understand where anxiety really comes from and how, um, you know, so we're gonna talk about what is anxiety, how prevalent uh, it is, uh, learn about the, uh, the brain development and, uh, um, and, and, and see how um, it relates to anxiety. Uh, learn how uh, children present with anxiety symptoms uh, in different manners at different ages. Um, uh, learn about different stressors that cause anxiety and learn about some of the cognitive distortion and thinking distortions that people generally have when they are going through um, the, the uh, anxiety um, situation, provoking situations. So let's really look at what is anxiety. Uh, so if we um, uh, look at Webster Dictionary, it uh, describes uh, anxiety as apprehensive uneasiness or nervousness, usually over an impending or anticipated ill. So people sometimes ask, you know, what's the difference between anxiety and fear? Uh, and I think the biggest difference, probably a uh, more easy one to understand is um, fear is more something that uh, you see that could be very dangerous. And anxiety is from an, an anticipation from that fear. So for example, uh, imagine if somebody is in a place uh, where there's shooting going around. So you're always obviously fearful because you hear the gun sound and you're fearful that some, some you know, that you're gonna get killed. But when you anticipate the outcome of, of that, uh, that fear, that's what anxiety is, when you anticipate what may happen. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of a you know, definitely difference between um, anxiety being uh, 
uh, more of an anticipation of uh, uh, something that may happen and, and then it causes some sort of uneasiness. And anxiety can be both uh, physical and emotional. So the, when we look at the medical definition of anxiety, we define it more as an abnormal and overwhelming sense of apprehension and fear, often marked by physical signs such as tension, sweating, uh, increased pulse rate. You know, and, and this is something that uh, you know you don't have to have an anxiety disorder to experience. Every single person in this world has experienced anxiety um, before a big exam, before a job interview. So these are, these physical symptoms are pretty common uh, that for everyone to have experience in their lives. Um, then it's uh, then there's a mental piece to it, uh, which is the doubt concerning the reality and nature of the threat and self-doubt about one's capacity to cope with it. So it could be anxiety about uh, failure, anxiety about uh, performance uh, at work. So it, it's a combination of physical and, uh, and emotional uh, difficulty. Uh, and that's probably the best way to kind of comprehend uh, anxiety uh, from a medical standpoint. The... Um, so if we, if we go uh, forward, let's look at how, how prevalent it is, you know. So in, in Western society, there's a lot of uh, prevalent studies, uh, you know, and, and they, they kind of go over a big range. You know, most studies show a prevalence rate of 7.1% between ages 3 and 17. Uh, so, you know, if, if you look at data like for other illnesses, just to understand what 7.1% prevalence means, if you look at diabetes, we're looking at maybe around 10% or so, some studies to 12. So, you know, it, it's, it's fairly common to have uh, anxiety uh, difficulties in children, uh, but the prevalence rate can go from 5% to 12%, depending on where the studies are done and what times are done. Um, when we look at the Muslim community, there's definitely a, a, quite a, a scarcity of data. Um, you know, partly because uh, some of it is misconceptions that why would children, you know, uh, you know, be anxious or stressed because we generally like to see childhood as a very happy, carefree kind of a time, um, uh, which, which, you know, and it's in some aspects is true, but then it still has uh, areas where anxiety can be so significant. So there have been some studies uh, if you look at it, uh, you know, there is a, a study out of a group in Chicago called Humboldt Clinic, um, which they do a lot of mental health work. They found a anxiety disorder in youth at 13%. So it's actually quite high. And there was an Iranian study that looked at ranges between five and 13. So I think in general, um, the rates are pretty similar. Maybe actually sometimes could be a little higher. Uh, it's especially, with uh, Muslim youth in, in Western societies because, um, you know, Muslim youth in, in, in Western societies are dealing with a lot of different things that maybe the youth are not necessarily experiencing so much in other societies. Um, part of it is the uh, stress of acculturation, you know, especially if you are uh, growing up in a first generation immigrant uh, parents home, um, you know, th there could be that added stress plus uh, some of the social distress that our Muslim youth has gone through in schools lately. That has had an impact also. So, um, so I think the, 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 the take home message from this is that we're not immune from anxiety as being Muslims. We have uh, some very unique sets of stressors. Our children have very unique set of stressors, both in homes and also in a larger community. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, um, definitely faith has a very significant protective factor, um, but it doesn't mean that something that we can't have anxiety just because we are Muslims, just like because we could have hypertension, asthma, and diabetes, so anxiety could be, uh, could be uh, prevalent also. Um, so many people think about anxiety as like, you know, what, how do you see if it's normal or abnormal, and is it ever normal? And anxiety is, there is a lot of uh, aspect of anxiety that's absolutely normal. And if you look at evolutionary, uh, uh, you know, evidence, um, anxiety comes from the area of brain that we also refer to as primitive brain because it's a very similar to uh, other animals. Um, and anxiety um, is there from, you know, other animals and humans to cause some protective fu function because if you don't anticipate something that is harmful, you could put yourself in, in, in harm's way. So, um, mashallah, Allah Taala has created this phenomenon to, to protect us, uh, to make us think more and choose wisely 
to save, keep ourselves safe and our families safe and, and, and for kids to stay safe in their environments. And the research show that, you know, when you, when you look at anxiety, there's a certain level of anxiety that actually is needed to motivate people and improve performance. So for example, if you don't have anxiety, if the kids don't have anxiety about performing in school or doing well on exam, they will just, you know, pretty much won't have much motivation. Um, some of it you may see nowadays because a lot of the schools are just going to pass fail kind of situation and uh, you know there's less expectations so there is a certain level of anxiety that promotes uh, motivation and improves performance but beyond a certain point it then starts to affect your areas of the brain where you remember things where you focus and that's when it starts to cause the uh, productivity. So it's a, it's a sort of a bell-shaped curve that you, your, your, your anxiety will improve performance up to a certain point and it starts to decline if it goes too much. So clearly there's a normal anxiety which is needed. Not having anxiety has its own risk. And just to give you a little uh, idea, this is, uh, I just wanted to show you in a, in a very rudimentary way, if you look at this picture of the brain, it shows two areas. So the, the, the limbic system, which is the central, so, sort of like a central part of the brain, it's very, which is what we call emotional brain. And this is a kind of brain we area of the brain we share with other animals. Um, and the red part is uh, where all the breathing and the temperature control comes from. But the limbic system, when we are born, uh, it's pretty active, you know. Uh, uh, it's an emotional brain, it's a fast, reactive. Um, and then we have this green area, the prefrontal cortex, that's the logical brain. That's the brain where we have rational thinking, decision making. And uh, this is what I sometimes conceptualize in my own head, that this is the car, car, part of the brain that makes us a makhluka. This is very different for us compared to other animals. And when kids are born, this area of the brain is, very, um, is not very well developed. And what happens that with age, this area starts to thicken. And then it starts to build nerve connections, which will then control the limbic system. So this neur neur neuronal connectivity is vital in building the ability to control your emotions. Uh, so if you see young kids, you know, they have very little control over their emotions. As they get older, uh, their self-control improves. Uh, and that has a lot to do with the, the how there's a growth in this prefrontal cortex and how it builds uh, connections to control the limbic system. Obviously, other animals don't have it and they don't have the uh, type of self-control that we carry. Uh, so it's just, uh, you know, uh, when we look at it, it's very interesting to see, you know, the brain and brain development. If we look at our brains, you know, an infant at birth has 100 billion neurons, 100 billion, and adults is roughly 86 billion. Uh, so as we grow, uh, our brain size increases, but our neurons decrease. And adult brain has almost 1,000 trillion nerve connections. So what happens in this growth phase is vital. So as the size is increasing, the neurons are decreasing in number because uh, as we call it in, in neurology is pruning, as if like you would prune like a, a shrub to make it healthier and grow. So the pruning uh, uh, gets affected by environment. You know, what nerve connection are going to survive and what will not survive has a lot to do with environment uh, beside biology. So there's always been an argument, um, you know, with nature versus nurture, you know, is it just how we're born or is it how our environment, you know, and, and, and what is it, you know, which part is more important or less important. Uh, and people have taken all kinds of extreme approaches, people taking, saying that nature is all it is, it's your biology, it's your genetics, and other people saying it's all the nurturance environment. I think it's both, uh, you know, and, and, I, and I give people example of, a simple example of a, of a hormone in our body called oxytocin. Um, it's a hormone produced by our brain, um, which tends to increase uh, in, in pregnancy and tend to really increase at around childbirth time. Uh, and uh, it induces labor movements, it reduces bleeding risk. But what it does, uh, it also increases the uh, ability for women to breastfeed, but then it also increases a desire to bond and hug. And in turn, generally, normally, mothers love to hug their babies. And, and, and if you, you, you know, when, when children are born in, in, in Western societies, I mean, also in East, everywhere else, you know, you put the kid right away to the mother uh, for the touch. What happens when you, when you hug a baby, it increases their levels of oxytocin.
and which is actually studies have shown is a stress reliever. It relaxes the mind, the body. It, it generates the feelings of love, warmth, trust. Uh, so if you look at it, a, a biological process gets affected by a, 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 a social reaction that uh, improves uh, the psychological well-being. And, and studies have shown us uh, consistently that as we are, as children are growing, uh, the environment plays a huge role in terms of how their brain develops, how they develop some sort of impulse control, how they manage their emotions better, uh, and how they're able to calm themselves down or not. So um, it's, a, it's a combination of both nature and nurture. So early life stressor and anxiety um, is, is, is very important to understand. The there's ample studies showing that early neglect and abuse causes uh, poor development in rational brain. So that, brain, that prefrontal cortex brain. So what happens when we see sometimes children who are going through significant neglect or abuse or trauma, uh, or uh, significant changes in their environment, even if it's not, even if it's not abusive, their their ability to control themselves is much much poorer because they do not have the same type of development in the frontal part of the brain. Uh, so their emotional brain is still pretty active, makes it much more difficult for them to control themselves. Uh, we know that kids who are well nurtured, uh, who live in a loving a caring, a consistent environment, have a bigger bigger hippocampal volumes in the brain. This is the area where you do new learning and your memory is stored. So simple things that we are all doing in our home, simple things that our, our religion teaches us, uh, things like loving, caring, meeting the needs, nurturing, uh, communicating, uh, meeting children's needs, keeping a good routine in their home, you know, all of those things has such a significant biological impact on and children's growth. And this starts very early on. In fact, studies have shown it starts almost perinatally when, when mothers are, are expecting. Uh, so I just want to briefly touch on one of these studies that, uh, that uh, was done in, in, West, uh, in England with Joan Bowlby, which changed uh, the whole setup we have with Western orphanages and to foster care because he saw that just having an eye contact with the kid is so important that when you don't have much of that, the kids start with feeding difficulties, growth problems, uh, because eye contact is nurturance. Uh, and uh, so, so it's, it's very important that these simple things uh, uh, are attended to. And important because when stress happens in life, these things can uh, go to the wayside because people are overwhelmed and parents are overwhelmed with their own stressors. So what is a stress for a child? So stress is defined as a state of mental or emotional strain or tension resulting from adverse or key or very demanding uh, circumstances. So stress is, uh, so is both external and internal. You know, a lot of people in general think that stress is only external. Uh, but many times the stress is just internal um, and you know you could have and, and we could see around you know around the world you know when we hear about these uh, people who have everything in their lives they're rich and famous and still ends up uh, being unhappy and kill themselves because their internal world is not in sync with their external world and, and, and it's, 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 there's a lot of upheaval and chaos there. So we're going to look at both. Uh, obviously, COVID-19 is more of a uh, more of an outside stress. But I would like to go to a point where I want to talk about what could be the internal stressor from that uh, the external uh, circumstance. So you know, external stressors for a kid uh, kid's life is usually number one is family stressors because that's where they 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 are spending the most time. Um, and family stressors could be many. Obviously, it could be things like marital discord. Uh, it could be uh, financial distress in the family. It could be frequent moves. Uh, it could be uh, uh, related to um, parents being uh, less available emotionally because they are overwhelmed with other stressors. Uh, so all those things, uh, you know, anything and, and anything that creates um, a lack of consistency in their environment is very significant for young children. Because what happens is that, uh, in general, as we sh uh, saw in, the, in, in how our brain is developing, the younger the children are, 
the less they have the capability of controlling their emotions. So if they're very susceptible to any sudden changes in their routine, in their home environment, and they tend to get very easily uh, overwhelmed with those uh, situations. So what happens that, uh, you know, if you have a situation where it's uh, quite stressful um, and, uh, and they are having difficulties uh, understanding it, their anxiety peaks very, very quickly. It could be even minor stressors of uh, suddenly a routine change. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, the home composition changes. You have lots of guests in the house. A very young kid could even get overwhelmed with that. Social stressors of slightly older kids who are in school uh, definitely makes a huge difference, uh, uh, especially, um, you know, uh, in our community, kids uh, uh, who are going to uh, public schools, for example, and have, a, have to interact with community that have different values and norms sometimes. It makes a huge difference. Uh, and sometimes they may, uh, uh, they may be facing uh, bullying or uh, other stressors, so that could be one. Uh, academic stressors, kids who are struggling academically, that could be a significant uh, problem. Uh, and then, they, then there are internal stressors. You know, internal stressors uh, are sometimes uh, harder, to, harder to assess and harder to get to, uh, but many times uh, they play a bigger role than, than the external stressors. Um, so internal stressors like uh, self-esteem, need for perfectionism, uh, perception of isolation. Uh, so if a kid has some of those difficulties, uh, especially the older they are, they could uh, have anxiety and stress, even, uh, even if their external environment is very uh, stable. But with those children who have self-esteem issues, if on top of that, they also have an external stress stressor, the anxiety stress is likely to be even worse. So, um, Developmentally, you know, kids are going through many different stages and, and, and there's been ample research looking at developmental data and looking at, you know, what, do we, what, what does a kid have to do at a certain age? What tasks do they, do they have to accomplish? And I'm sure that uh, parents who have, gone, who have had young kids go through uh, kindergarten, preschool, to see that, you know, they go through all developmental as aspects and there's a physical aspect to it. But I, I sometimes try to conceptualize and see, okay, well, how do I, you know, how do we just simplify it. And if we simplify it in, in, in one or two words, age zero to seven is an age where, you, where a child is really requiring a lot of nurturance. This is a stage where kids are really looking for a lot of attachment. Uh, they want their needs to be met. Uh, they uh, want to make sure that they uh, are taken care of. Uh, again, because biologically they're very limited in terms of uh, how much they can do on their own. When they come to ages eight to 12, uh, you're looking at competence. They're really there to learn new skills, build new skills. And when you go down to adolescence, it's you have social competence and you have identity. So those are some stages that, you know, that, that are the most predominant uh, um, in, in different stages. So COVID-19 is a stressor. It's an external stressor uh, because it creates two big things. It, it creates a lack of control. Uh, and it creates a lot of uncertainty. Um, and, and they were tied in because the uncertainty actually generates a lot of lack of control. Right now, uh, you know, uh, as adults were being told, uh, stay home, our work's telling them, you know, stay home or you're furloughed or you're, you're fired or, you know, or, you know, and then it creates a lot of uncertainty. Um, we have no uh, uh, clear answers of what's it gonna like, when is it gonna end, when is, how's it gonna perform, uh, continue, whether it's going to come back, or if it comes back, what's going to happen? Kids are sc in school. So, uh, you know, COVID-19 may be, may be a, a new infection, but the stressors can, it's creating emotionally is coming from the same difficulties that other things create uh, and create anxiety, which is uncertainty and lack of control. I think in, in and that's my own experience, and maybe uh, some people may dis uh, differ from it, but in Western societies where we generally have developed even better ways of controlling um, our environment compared to say other countries, you know, we're very blessed in terms of uh, how we live, uh, how we have uh, uh, nice comfortable homes, uh, nice comfortable temperature controls, nice comfortable transportation, uh, schools, you know, so the more control we have developed, the more vulnerable we've become when we don't have a sense of control. We're more vulnerable to some extent in terms of anxiety because 
uh, it's almost like our brain is almost uh, use it or lose it. Uh, so if we're not using those capabilities in a, in a day in day out, we tend to be more vulnerable when those situations arise. Compare that to say a, a different country, uh, in, in many of us who lived in or grew up in third world countries, we know how people go through significant stressors uh, with relatively less discomfort. Not that they don't have anxiety, but uh, because they live day in day out with lots of uncertainty sometimes, they build those structures. So I think um, COVID-19 as a stressor has created some of the things that uh, we're probably even less uh, adapted to, to deal with. Uh, and it's causing a lot of stressors both for adults, parents, and then you know, children and, and in turn. So what are some of the maladaptive ways of coping when you have an outside stressor, whether it's COVID-19 or whether it's somebody, something else? I mean, you know, some of these things are absolutely simple. I mean, there isn't anything unique about the anxiety created by uh, COVID-19, except a few, uh, such as that everybody is kind of in the same situation, which is usually unusual. But the question to ask is, if, if we all in the same situation, does that mean all of us have anxiety or all of us have the same level of anxiety? Not. And that's not what it is. I mean, everybody is coping differently. And that's when the internal stressors and internal processing uh, comes up. Uh, so the internal stressors, uh, in when you're facing an outside stress, is how do we process the stress? How do we? How do our brain, the frontal part of the brain uh, that controls the uh, emotional part of the brain, how does it process this? And that's what our cognition is, thinking process. And there are things called cognitive distortions that are maladaptive ways to assess a situation. Some of the examples are all or nothing thinking, such as, oh, it's never gonna get better. Oh, uh, yeah, you know, it's gonna get worse, for far worse, it's never gonna improve. I will never have any ways to manage it. That's sort of black and white thinking. Uh, very common um, for adults and older teenagers uh, to get into that sort of uh, difficulties. Younger kids generally developmentally think like that, so it's not so unusual when they have that. Um, even early teenagers sometimes have that sort of thinking. But what happens is that even adults and older teenagers, when they get stressed, we all tend to regress emotionally and we regress back to some of the older ways of thinking that were normal, say in, in uh, uh, ages when we were eight to 12 or 12 to 14. So all or nothing thinking is pretty common in certain stages and normal, uh, but not as you get older and you're, you're an older teenager or an adult. Uh, Overgeneralization. Uh, when you have one small uh, stress, for example, yes, there is stress related to COVID-19, uh, but people then generalize like it is now completely end of the world. Uh, you know, I'm going to have nothing left in life. And, uh, you know, you make things look bigger than how they are. Uh, another example is mental filter, like dwelling only on negatives, uh, not looking at anything positive. Uh, so, for example, uh, yes, parents are very stressed right now. However, uh, if you look at it, you know, there's always someone who has much more difficulties than you have, and there's always some positives. You know, you could be isolated at home, but at least you have your uh, own home, you know, you're safe. You know, some of us are working from home, so at least you have your job. You know, uh, the, the groceries can be delivered. You know, so there are ways to challenge that, but people tend to get constantly just negative processing of these things. Magnification or minimization, somewhat same to all or nothing principle. Should statements like, uh, oh, I should have done this, uh, I should have bought this, I should have uh, decided this way, um, a lot of blaming, criticizing. So these are different ways of people facing a stress and then processing the stress in a way that makes them much more vulnerable to anxiety. So this happens with adults, this happens with teenagers, Obviously, uh, these thought processes can happen with in different ways with young children also. So, so let's go more specifically how children at certain ages deal with anxiety and how do they present anxiety. So when anxiety comes in, um, in a kid who's young, zero to seven, uh, remember that they, they are, their brain is still developing. They don't have the same verbal capabilities to express themselves. Uh, you know, so you see a lot of physical changes and, and what we call changes in vegetative symptoms, symptoms of uh, sleep, appetite, those kind of things. Which, you know, they, are, they are very fearful of being alone. They start to have a lot of bad dreams. 
they could have speech difficulties. Sometimes they could start having some regressive speech, more childlike speech. They could have bedwetting, loss of bladder, ball control, constipation. Uh, they could have changes in appetite and they could be more whiny or clingy. Uh, they tend to uh, find it very difficult to separate from, uh, from the parents uh, because of their fear of anxiety. So in general, the kids uh, you know, may seem to all of a sudden have all these physical symptoms and all of these regressive behaviors. So six-year-old who had attained ball control, all of a sudden uh, having problems or having bedwetting. Uh, and these are signs of regression to, old, to younger ages. And that happens both with anxiety and it also can happen just with stress. Uh, so uh, those are some clear patterns we see with young children uh, ages zero to seven. So um, how do you manage this? So the first thing, you know, in this particular age group, obviously you, 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 with all ages, you start with first thing is patience and tolerance. Uh, so that's probably the most important thing. Because one thing you have, we have to understand that with, with kids, um, we, you, we can tell them anything, but they learn the best in what they see. So screaming and yelling at a kid to tell him not to scream is not going to work very well because they always the, the, the non-verbal communication uh, through actions always speaks a lot louder than the words do uh, and it's very interesting if you look at it kids development they don't understand language until much older in their life but they start to get nonverbal cues much earlier. So this is how you know our vision and our ears develop first before our ability to process language. So it's important to tell kids what they need to do and reassure them verbally and physically. You know, hugging, touching. Again, that oxytocin theory. You know, hugging uh, releases that, or relaxes your body. Those are important. But it's more important to really, as parents, to look at our own selves and manage our own emotions better. Because if we're not gonna be able to manage our own emotions better, if we're not communicating with our other adult loved ones, whether it's spouse, parents, friends, siblings, then our stress is gonna build up and everything else we try to do and we learn and we wanna do will be hard to do because we're just not patient and tolerant. Uh, you know, young kids brain is, is very under, underdeveloped uh, you may reassure them, but they may want to come back to get reassured again because they don't store the process information as much as adults do. So, uh, so you know, reassurance, problem, physical, patient tolerance, you know, encouraging expression through play. Um, so unfortunately, uh, in this day and age, you know, most of our play has become through video games, which has taken some of the imaginative stuff out. But there are some, even some video games that have more imaginative things that you can create. But you know things like uh, for boys creating like uh, Lego sets, say creating a safe house, creating an imaginary situation that you can play with. You know, same way that young girls, you know, like to play with dolls, and you can have a lot of reenactment and playing through that, which and create situations which are stressful, and and through the play, resolving them, um, it helps a lot. Storytelling helps a lot. Uh, kids really understand the storytelling uh, very well. It could be very soothing and comforting. Uh, since sleep is a big issue at this age, uh, you know, short-term sleep arrangement changes could be okay as long as they're not long-term because you don't want to foster the the clinginess too much. Uh, you want that independence. Uh, but you know, if it means that a young child now require you to be in bed with them at bedtime for, for a little bit, maybe for storytelling and comforting, soothing and touching physically, uh, that's fine. Uh, in a worst case scenario, if kids are really nervous and need to sleep in your bedroom for a short term, that could be considered. Usually we don't recommend that for long term, but you know, in this kind of stressful situation like COVID-19, you consider that. Uh, but always good to kind of keep trying to foster some independence uh, once things uh, resolve. Uh, you know, planning, calming, comforting activities before bedtime. Because for young children, bedtime is a, is a time of separation from the parent. And that's a generally a very anxiety provoking time. So starting to prepare it, you know, um, um, and especially like with storytelling, book reading, laying in bed together, those kind of things could be very, very comforting. Um, maintaining a regular family routine is very important. So one thing we have to understand, we don't control what happens with COVID-19. We don't control what the government decide. Uh, what we control is our homes, you know, 
And keeping that routine is so important, especially the younger the kids are, the more important it is because they're so susceptible to environmental changes or routine that their anxiety tends to increase fast. So keeping the same routine or building a routine, it could be simple as taking 10, 15 minutes every night to decide, okay, What's going to be the routine tomorrow? Maybe writing it down, maybe involving them saying, hey, maybe let's bring your color uh, markers. Let's uh, make a nice colorful routine for tomorrow and you can hang it in your room so you know what we're going to do. It will help you as a parent also because then you don't have to think next day, okay, what do I need to do now with the kid? So, you know, and think about some contingency plan if something doesn't happen with the routine. Uh, avoiding media exposure, limiting it as much as, as you can, I think could be uh, very helpful uh, because uh, yeah, that could sometimes increase anxiety. So uh, going ahead, uh, let's look at what about anxiety in eight to 12 year olds. So the kids have, have developed more now. By this time, they are starting to have more of an ability to express their emotions, uh, more of their ability to express emotions uh, verbally. Um, uh, so what do, you, what do we see now? So we see a lot more emotional symptoms, irritability, whining, maybe aggressive behavior. Uh, again, as we said that there will be some uh, regression, there is regression in, in uh, these children also. So the kids who were by now like nine, 10 years old, they're pretty independent. Now they're starting to get more clingy. They start having more nightmares. All of a sudden they don't wanna be sleeping in their own rooms. Uh, you, they have the same sleep appetite differences. They may have a little bit more frequent physical complaints, headaches, stomach aches. Uh, again, young kids have developed, this, this age group has developed some ability to express themselves verbally, but not completely. And they may have some of these difficulties where they would have uh, physical symptoms as manifestation of anxiety. Uh, then uh, you, you, you know, the kids could start to isolate more from peers, uh, start to have some loss of interest. Um, there is a uh, you know, um, competition for parents' attention between siblings, uh, forgetfulness about chores and new information learned in school. Again, stress effects or anxiety, stress kids' ability to learn and memorize things. And there could be some regression in their ability to uh, uh, function the same way academically as they used to. So with this age group, again, we start with the same, patience, tolerance, reassurance. Um, very important. Again, uh, I already emphasized that, so I'm not going to spend more time on it. Um, uh, you know, play sessions, staying in touch with friends through telephone, internet, to some extent, you know, not, not completely in control. Uh, uh, regular exercise and stretching, especially at this age, uh, exercise can be very, very helpful in, uh, in incre increasing in normal brain chemicals like endorphins, and they're very relaxing. Um, you know, keeping some time to do some educational activities workbooks, educational games, school work that's uh, get assigned nowadays, uh, getting them involved in a structured household chores. So doing some things, activities together, it could be going on, doing the yard cleaning and doing activities in the house, uh, setting up gentle but firm limits. Uh, kids at this age now, you know, they, they, they do get to a point where they want to negotiate everything. Uh, and you want to make sure that uh, as, as a couple, as, as parents, you've decided, okay, this is what's allowed, this is what's not allowed, uh, with some wiggle room, and, and, but generally staying uh, uh, firm, yet gentle. Uh, there's no need, you know, so this doesn't get you at, uh, us anywhere of screaming and yelling. It does get us farther uh, when we have firm limits, but uh, soft tone. Uh, discuss the current outbreak, especially the older kids. Uh, encourage questions uh, and be, be okay and, and saying, well, we don't know. I mean, you know, some things we don't know. Uh, discuss what uh, as family we're doing, what we're as a community we're doing. I mean, I'm sure the kids have a lot of questions about uh, not being able to go to the mosque for Friday prayers, not able to go to mosque in Ramadan. So I think those are important uh, you know, questions to address. Um, again, ex expression through play and conversation. Uh, create ideas for enhancing health promote, promotion behaviors and maintaining family routines. This is an age group where uh, kids are beginning to take more of a proactive uh, uh, approach to life. You know, you want them to uh, take ownership of some of these behaviors themselves. So you don't have to remind them uh, to wash your hands, wash your hands this, this way. You know, you want them to start learning and then you, you, your role is there to uh, distantly monitor and encourage and, 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 and give them kudos if they're doing a good job there. Limiting media exposure, uh, you know, it's, it's okay to discuss every day and 
look at the news maybe 15, 20 minutes, the more than that doesn't get you any new information. It just increases anxiety. Uh, any stigma, discrimination, you know, that's going on uh, because of this, unfortunately, uh, you know, if we don't address, sometimes kids don't feel comfortable bringing it up. You know, so um, luckily the kids are somewhat isolated, they're not going to school, but you know, this is gonna continue for some time. So if these things come up and we're not approaching kids and asking them to discuss it, they may not feel comfortable and, and, and that doesn't help the situation because the anxiety keeps increasing and nobody's addressing it. So then we uh, go into um, uh, in adolescence. Now adolescence, you know, especially older adolescents, and now we're coming close to how adults would exp experience anxiety. So yes, there are still some physical symptoms, uh, especially children or teenagers who are unable to express themselves uh, very well verbally, um, or they are at homes where physical expression is more accepting than, uh, ver than emotional expression. Uh, which unfortunately to some extent is more common in our community. It's okay to talk about headache and rashes and body aches and uh, stomach aches rather than uh, anxiety and stress. So pay attention to these. Uh, again, uh, there are other reasons for it too. So it's not that somebody has a headache, it's just anxiety. But if you know there is consistent increasing headaches and there is no clear explanation, medical explanation, you do start to think about a stress and anxiety sleep appetite difference, disturbances, agitation, decrease in energy and empathy, uh, ignoring health promotion behaviors. That's more typical of teenage years because teenage brain is very risky and impulse taking. There is the renewed uh, sense of uh, competence uh, going through the earlier stages of development. And there's, uh, there's also some, some, of, some sort of short sightedness in terms of uh, the consequences. So kids tend to be more of a risk taker at this stage. Uh, and they're more likely to say, well, I'm not gonna follow the, all these controls that you're putting me, uh, putting me under and what the government's putting me under. Um, they also tend to get very frustrated because of isolation of peers and loved ones. All kids can, but they are most vulnerable because uh, peers uh, become a very uh, big piece of their lives at this time and uh, isolation uh, doesn't help and increases more irritability. Concerns about stigma and injustices because uh, at this stage, Ellison's brain is processing what we call abstract thinking. They're starting to look into different concepts uh, about morality, values. So they would argue a lot about and, and bring it up. But it's very, very important this time for parents to communicate with teenagers about different stigmas related to COVID-19, different injustices that may be happening because of the current situation. Uh, whether people are calling it a Chinese virus or you know, blaming uh, people who don't look like them as a reason for it. It's important to talk about it. Again, sometimes you, know, you may not change anything, but, but just being able to sit down and talk about some of these things um, it helps a teenager feel like they could share it with an adult and that reduces anxiety. Secondly, it can also give them a feeling that you know, uh, you, 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 can, you can comfort them with the feelings like, you know, this is something that has always happened and there are ways to deal with it. And we have uh, our Islamic history is filled with periods where we were treated with injustices. And, and, and you know, some of those examples could be very comforting. Uh, uh, avoiding cutting school, uh, obviously not an issue in this particular situation, but uh, a, a different sort of situation I think is happening more that Kids are, teenagers are more relaxed, uh, you know, they're not taking the schoolwork seriously um, and, and they can definitely lag academically with it. So how do you manage with this? Again, start with patient tolerance reassurance, uh, encourage continuation of routines, very important. Uh, very commonly I'm seeing with teenagers right now that their sleep routine is absolutely in shambles. Uh, kids are sleeping four or five in the morning and not waking up until one o'clock. Uh, it can have a negative impact uh, on f physically uh, uh, and also uh, so emotionally, especially the longer it goes. And there is destruction of uh, outward experience with peers, family. Uh, don't force it, but I think it'd be a good idea to just bring it up uh, at a dinner table and talk about uh, what's going on. And th this is the age group where they really love to discuss these things. And when I say not force is because they want to be heard because in their mind, they kind of know all the answers right now and they've developed a lot of understanding of things. And they really love it when you let them express themselves and listen to it 
uh, and then be patient and then respond to your with your opinions and have a fresh discussion. So it, it, it is actually could be a very good uh, bonding time at this time. And sometimes, you know, parents complain about how hard it is to bond with teenagers. And this, this could be a, a, a one area where you can start to find opportunities to, to bond. Staying in touch with friends through telephone and memory games, but definitely with some limitations, not like playing six, you know, 10 hours a day. Um, participate in family routines, chores, you know, including younger siblings, planning strategies, health promotion behaviors, media exposure should be limited. And again, discussing the stigma and injustices. Um, the, um, so the younger kids, the youngest kids group, uh, more physical symptoms, the second group, you know, some physical, but more emotional, and then adults and more emotional symptoms. Um, youngest group as a general, uh, routine, nurturance, providing uh, the, uh, the comfort. The second group, you know, same things, but also adding a little bit more discussion and then also a lot more discussion uh, for the for, to control anxiety. So um, since we talked about the Edelson and we talked about the cognitive uh, distortions, those are more common with teenagers. So how do you work on these maladaptive coping? Well, you identify the distortion, whether it's you're overgeneralizing or you're just catastrophizing and just saying everything is black, you know, negative. You examine the evidence. You really sit down and say, okay, what are the, uh, so give me a personal example. You know, you could look at the evidence of COVID-19, oh, the world is falling apart, you know, infection is everywhere. Or you can sit down and say, okay, hold on, let's look at it. You know, we have a country of 300 million. We got a million people infected. Okay, let's see, what's the, what's the percentage? Uh, out of those, uh, uh, you know, 77,000 people unfortunately died. Yes, a big number. Uh, however, there are lots of people who have not had the infection. So it's, yes, we have to be very cautious. We have to be very, very um, cognizant of the risks. However, it's not uh, the end all kind of situation. Um, and, then in, in, and then after you examine that, I mean, you then move forward and looking, okay, how do you, Deal with this. So I think you know uh, evidence, facts, data to examine the evidence of your thought process and challenging it is a way to start with. And trying to think in the shades of gray, you know, not trying to be black and white. Now teenagers, especially younger teenagers, they generally ask all all good and bad, uh, so it gets a little tricky with them. But you gently bring up the facts and discuss that to see. Um, and you know, just survey. You know, other ask other people. I mean, uh, is it realistic what I'm thinking about? You know, is it right or wrong? Uh, and, and those are, you know, some ways of uh, managing the anxiety in these situations, both for adults and older teenagers. So the other thing is uh, the concept of mindfulness. Um, that's very uh, uh, famous nowadays. You know, it's a mental state achieved by focusing one's awareness on the present moment uh, and the idea of radical acceptance. I see it the closest to what we say in Islam is tawakkul. Um, you know, last week uh, the Imam was mentioning that, and it was just a really great presentation. Talk about resilience and Tawakkul's role in that. Mindfulness is gaining a lot of traction in the U.S., um, um, and they're looking at it. You know, it's based in Buddhist philosophy, but it's, but a lot of it is really absolutely simple. Of, you know, what we have in, in our religion, uh, you know, it's focusing on accepting the reality, especially in situations where you can't change it. And just focusing uh, on, on accepting rather than changing it, you know, feeling and accepting current emotions, you know, a mindfulness uh, practice include or daily meditation. For us, I think uh, we have five times a day that we can really meditate. And we say, Allahu Akbar, we left the whole world behind and we try to meditate in our prayer. Uh, and, you know, it's an interesting uh, conference I attended in mindfulness in Ann Arbor a couple of years ago. And this uh, presenter was from Boston. Um, and, and it was a weekend conference in the first uh, two hours after this finishing, he said, well, we'll meet after the break, inshallah. Uh, and then he said, does anybody know what inshallah means? And obviously uh, I was the only one who knew it, but he said that his, his daughter was in Egypt and uh, she told him about this word. And he think that that's the most mindfulness filled uh, word because you're just leaving it to Allah and hoping and praying. So there is a level where, yes, you need to be proactive, doing the things, take care of your health, take care of your community. But there's also a point where you say, you know what, this is my limitation, I accept it. And now I'm just gonna leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm gonna uh, accept what it is. 
uh, and uh, and pray for it. And and that mindfulness concept is very good. And then and, and that's good for older teenagers, but it's even good for young kids in a different way. I mean, it could be a you know like in a lot of schools, like a lot of our Islamic schools at MIA Crescent, they do a lot of these uh, uh, circles for young kids. You know, it's a good place. You know, think about it like a five ten, five minute of uh, quiet time, sit down, and and I think that could be a good one, just five minutes for a young kid. So there's a level of it that we can practice everywhere. And there are lots of uh, uh, things available online about mindfulness that could be very effective in anxiety management. Uh, so when is anxiety anxiety disorder? It's when it's severe or very frequent effect functioning when symptoms are causing significant disruption in people's environment or when it's causing significant physical symptoms for which you don't find any medical cause. That's when it starts to cross into from normal anxiety to a psychiatric disorder. Uh, when to ask for help, anytime there's a severity of symptoms, uh, uh, when there's significant physical symptoms, when there's functioning difficulties for kids, it's usually school, or when it starts to affect mood, or when it starts to significantly affect sleep, appetite, weight, those kind of things. Uh, so two things, severity and frequency and the length. Uh, you know, everybody gets some anxiety that's not concerning. If anxiety is continuing for weeks and after weeks or months after months, that's when you get concerned. Uh, and what kind of help available if in case you do need uh, psychotherapy, which is counseling, uh, no medication, just uh, counseling, meeting somebody to work on, uh, counselors work through mindfulness techniques, they can work on cognitive behavioral therapy to address cognitive distortions. And then sometimes medications can be helpful. There are some medications that have been studied with kids young, as young as eight for anxiety. Definitely that's for more severe situations when psychotherapy has failed. Uh, that's when you look at some of those things. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, uh, hopefully, you know, nobody gets to that point. But uh, I think if you, like, like the imam last week was mentioning that if you get to a situation like this, uh, it is an additional tool to help with medication besides psychotherapy. So that uh, uh, ends uh, the presentation. And I'm open to any, uh, any questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zubairi, for walking us through uh, like the different stages of brain, uh, how our brain like functions as a, as young kids compared to adults, and how the development of the brain, and walking us through the stress and anxiety. Uh, for people who have any questions, uh, please just put it in the chat box uh, or. Uh, also, like we can just open the mic. Uh, so if you want to ask the question directly, but I, I have a, a couple questions in mind. Uh, so while uh, like why the parents are just working so hard, I felt myself like the kids do have a certain level of uh, stress. And uh, as you describe, also like there are different levels of anxiety about this COVID-19. Uh, what I observed myself like if we go to play outside the house and interact, uh, like just the interaction, watching their interaction with the neighbors, uh, uh, kids that they used to interact very freely. Now you see this, like there's some kind of a gap and they, they are afraid of like, uh, they don't want to be too close, but at the end, like even it goes to a little extreme that they don't want to even talk. Like they just want to separate so I, I just uh, wonder, like, if you have any words into, uh, for us as parents, how to manage this, and also like during the lockdown and after potentially the lockdown. Yeah, I think that that's such a such a valid point, and I think that you know it's uh, it will be very interesting to see what eventually happens over time. I think right now it's difficult because we have to really be cautious about everything. But I, I worry about long term, you know, we have to be more cautious, say six months down the road, that this doesn't become like a ingrained behavior because uh, one of my concerns about uh, our, our children in this age is that they're already more distant and more communicating with phone and everything. Uh, so I think that, you know, there is a potential of making things worse. It's a little tricky right now, I think, from a medical standpoint, because I think distancing, you know, has its value. So we have to, you know, be cautious in doing that. But I also think that when, when this starts to end, that's when it's important how do we bring ourselves and our kids back to 
what we need to, because especially in our communities, you know, we're very social people, you know, we connect with each other a lot, you know, at mosque and everywhere, we have big families, and we want to make sure that in our community, we don't lose that, really, uh, because, you know, I think, you know, this will be an Eid where it will be very different for us, but we want to make sure that if everything is better, then the next Eid, we're bringing things back to as much normal as possible, because I think, I think you brought a very good point, uh, uh, well, seeing that I think we need to be cognizant that we, this does not continue in the long term because it will have much far, far more consequences uh, socially and, and family-wise. And the second question, like what advice you have for us parents, like now uh, when you have uh, a working, uh, let's say like a, uh, the mom or the dad who's uh, used to just take care of the kids now, they might have work plus taking care of the kids plus uh, all the home schooling, uh, like a yeah. uh, huge load of work. And then on top of this, sometimes like you, you have to constantly find uh, things for the kids to do. So it, it get to, to, to the point like it's overwhelming. So having the balance between finding stuff to do with the kids and, uh, and also like allowing the kids to do like, let's say, video games, watching TV, like right. what's the balance during yeah. the outer break compared to outside the outer break? Right, right. Well, I mean, I think I think it definitely this outbreak is putting us in a, a situation where you may have to be more flexible with, with what you generally you know, wanted to do, like in terms of restrictions certain activities, because kids are constantly home. The two things I would say, Whenever we talk about people needing to take care of someone else, it's important to take care of ourselves. So I think as parents, the first thing is taking a time out every day for the couple to discuss themselves. How is it going on? How we're stressed? Because again, if we don't do that, no matter how much of a planning you do, it's going to fall apart because your emotions will take over. Because just like we, the kids have that development in the frontal brain and the, and the limbic system and the emotional brain, we have the same thing. And when we get stressed, our emotional brain will take over our rational brain and we maybe get more stressed, angry, irritable with kids and it will and will kind of destroy everything else you're trying to do. So the first thing is taking time out as a couple to talk about every day. And the second thing also to take some time to, like I was saying that, you know, planning out maybe as a couple and then planning out with the, with the kids so they could, uh, you, know, uh, you know, sit down and say, okay, this is going to be the routine. The more we build the routine in advance, more proactively, the less stress it will be uh, when something happens. I mean, something still may happen, especially with the young kids. But I think the building a routine in advance can be helpful. Taking care of our own emotions can be very helpful. And be a little flexible. I, I think, you know, for example, uh, and I know you, as a pediatrician, you know more about, the, you know, American Pediatric Association requirements, like, this is what recommendation is for TV time and screen time. Maybe you've got to be a little bit flexible right now, just the way that things are. Uh, and if you have the ability to, to be out when the weather is better, maybe some physical activity. So, you know, everybody gets a little space would be very helpful. Yeah, and I think uh, other, uh, uh, other just mentioning that the, it was a very good talk and uh, they benefited. And as I mentioned, inshallah, we recorded this, so inshallah, we'll share it with the community. Yeah. So jazakumullah khairan. I just want to remind yeah. everybody for the third session, inshallah, next week uh, for COVID survival guide uh, by Dr. Shmaila Yunus. Inshallah, at the same timing on Saturday. Jazakumullah khair, Dr. Zabairi, and uh, inshallah, we'll look forward to other talks, inshallah, in the future. Inshallah, inshallah. Thank you very much for the Salaam. opportunity. Yeah.